Hi, uh, today what we're going to do is uh, we're going to look at uh, SQL Server partitioning. Now, uh, partitioning has been around for quite some time, so we're not really getting into the details of partitioning uh, as such. We're uh, just going to go ahead and look at a couple of things that you need to keep in mind as far as uh, when to use partitioning and what other choices you have. Now, as you can see here, I've got the latest version of SQL Server available, which is uh, SQL Server 2014. Now, essentially, the partitioning feature hasn't changed between uh, SQL 2014, 2012, or any of the previous versions. But the idea here is to introduce partitioning in whichever the latest version is so that you get to see how to implement it. Now, the first thing we need to understand about partitioning is that partitioning is really just a mechanism of arranging data on the hard disk. Now, we've always been able to do that with the use of file and file groups, but the behavior is uh, different depending on whether you've implemented partitioning or whether you've just gone ahead and moved the files and file groups to different locations. The primary idea here is that when you use file and file groups, you're actually moving an object or a table into a specific file group. And as a result, that file group then distributes data across multiple files. Let me see if we can just draw that up real quick. So here's what we have. We've got a database. And in the database, we've got a table. Now typically what happens is one table resides only in one file group. So if this was the table, it resides in a file group and the file group in turn typically uses just one file. Now we have the option of being able to actually place a table inside a file group and have the file group placed across multiple files. In this case, what happens is you'll have multiple files using a common file group. And inside that file group, you would then have the table. So that would look something like this. table, file group, an MDF file, and maybe an NDF file. Right. So what's the difference between this approach versus this one? The obvious first big advantage or uh, difference that you'll notice is that here the entire table resides in a single file. And this is usually good if the size of the table is small. Ideally, the scans of the I.O. operation that you want to do resides on a single file, and therefore all the data that you want to fetch would also be typically fetched from one location. And for small tables, this works very well. However, when you're dealing with larger tables, especially tables that span multiple gigabytes, usually data warehousing fact tables, you want to spread the I.O. as much as possible. And one way to do that is to create multiple files. So you have your N MDF file here, and then you got the NDF file here, and place them on different disks. Essentially, because they are on different disks, they'll have their own needle or spindles, and each needle or spindle will then fetch one piece of data parallelly from each one of these files. So what you're essen essentially doing here is you're splitting the workload and running it in parallel. And that's achieved by just going ahead and placing this data in a file group that has multiple files. The key difference between this approach compared to partitioning is that you don't really have a say in where the data would be placed in each of these files. The reason for that is because as far as the files are concerned, they still logically look like a single file to the table. And as a result, what happens is that the table inserts data based on the fill factor for the underlying object. So. Here we come up with a slight problem or a issue that's actually called proportional filling. In this case what happens is depending on the amount of free space on each of these files, SQL Server will then automatically proportionally fill 
the files depending on how much data it needs to insert. So say for example if you've got the NDF file which has got 50% free space and the NDF file which has got 100% free space then you will see twice the amount of data getting into the NDF file as compared to the MDF file. The reason for this is to balance the amount of I.O. that happens on each of these files. Now as a best practice what we normally do is we go ahead and ensure that all of the files have the same size that is the initial size, the maximum size as well as the same auto growth settings. This way both files will grow together simultaneously as well as shrink simultaneously depending on when the data is being inserted or deleted and it kind of balances out the hardware utilization that you're looking for. So this is good when we're trying to just balance out a single table across multiple files and we're not really concerned about the order of the data being stored inside the table. Uh, a typical example of this could be something like um, an address table or a table that contains customer information where the intention is that you've got a huge table that's being accessed very frequently and you need very good read operation on that particular underlying table. However, at any given point of time, any row from the table is accessible and needs to be available to the end user to perform user activity. In these cases, you can't really predict where the data that you want is going to resi uh, reside and more importantly, you don't have any data artifact or basically a legacy of the data in terms of uh, which data is rele relevant and current. So you have to assume that at any given point of time any data in the table is the most useful one and therefore you're just really optimizing for the data access more than really looking at the nature of the data that you want to work with. When you have these kind of scenarios it's usually better not to implement partitioning because in partitioning, one of the key advantages that we have is the ability to eliminate partitions, that is, not have to worry about data that you don't need anymore. Typically, a sc scenario like this would mean a fact table that's supposed to contain data for the last 10 years. So with every 11th year, you just go ahead and remove the last or the very first partition in that group. In this way, you're maintaining a rolling window function for uh, storing the data in the partition. So. With the theory out of the way, let's go ahead and look at how the same approach that we saw here would be implemented if you were using partitioning. The key thing to remember here is that the entire table resides in a single file group. Whereas now with partitioning, what you can do is, assuming you have a database and the database has a table, the table would then reside in different partitions based on the nature of the data itself. So say for example we've got a couple of part, uh, file groups here and let's for the time being assume that each file group just has a single file. This is my table. This is my file group. and each of these file groups in turn essentially are just residing or have just one file in them. The key thing to understand here is that these file groups are basically containers and unlike previously where we had the issue with proportional filling and we couldn't predict where each row went, with partitioning we can now actually predict where the data will go. So if this was the case what we actually have here is that all the data for 2011 would go into the first partition. Right, so let's go ahead and uh, say that 2011 goes here. And then we got another file for 2012, another file for 2013, another file for 2014, another file for 2015, and obviously the last one is 2016. So here Earlier in our first scenario, we could have a data being inserted for January 2012. And that would then 
depending on proportional filling, either get inserted into this one file here. So let's go ahead and do that right now. Or the very next row for uh, February 2012 would then get inserted here. And then maybe March would come here and April. So what happens here is that you can't really say that this file contains the data only for January or February or March because you don't really have a control over how the data is placed in each of these files. Whereas in partitioning what happens is that you can actually specify in which file the data should reside. And this is the advantage that partitioning gives us because when you're having data that's maybe used frequently in, in a disproportionate way, for example, 90% of the time you're using the latest data for maybe the last 10 years or maybe the last two years. In that case, your most active partitions are going to be, let's say, uh, 2014 and 2013. So these particular files, you can then go ahead and place them in extremely fast disk arrays in order to improve the read and write performance. Whereas for the 2011 and 2012 partitions, which are less frequently accessed, you can go ahead and place them on slightly uh, redundant uh, read arrays that are optimized just for read performance, assuming that you don't uh, do a lot of write activity later on. So the good thing about partitioning is that you have fine-grained control over where the files are placed on the underlying file system. And this is the big advantage that everybody typically wants out of uh, partitioning. Now that we have the theory out of the way, in the next video I'm going to go ahead and show you how to implement partitioning as well as the above scenario here. Thank you for watching.